The following program is in no way intended to replace your doctor's advice or treatment program, nor should it be used as a tool for the purpose of self-diagnosis. Good evening, and you're joining us once again for another edition or first edition for 2020 of Your Health, Your Choice. It's Wednesday, the 22nd of January, 2020. And as usual, we have with us our in-house medic, Dr. Claude Khan. And this evening's issue, as you can see from the bottom of your screen, is Your Health, Your Choice with regards to men's health in particular. And uh, why, Dr. Khan, have we chosen this men's topic? Health. So, um, uh, thinking about the program kicking off the year, um, I thought that um, the whole issue of men's health, and I think uh, it was the North Central Health Authority, um, I think they're having a day coming up or has gone uh, where they're inviting men to come in mm -hmm. um, for screening mm -hmm. for various um, health issues that are very common in men. We know that men tend to go to their doctors less than females. That's yeah. a fact. Um, mm -hmm. Females during pregnancy, um, having pap smears, mammograms, um, it's kind of um, routine and it's really pushed very heavily. But the whole idea of men going in for routine health screening, screening is not one that we are very, um, I wouldn't say familiar, but it's not one that we are maybe comfortable with. Mm -hmm. uh, the, 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 the psychology of healthcare in this country is still um, not preventative. Mm -hmm but it's dealing with issues as they arise. Did you say it's more female-centered? Um, it's uh, more female-centered, not, not necessarily from the professional point of view, mm -hmm. but it's getting men to go into their doctors. Mm -hmm. That's the problem. And you know, very often, and I know even tonight, um, we may have a larger female audience than male audience. So we are saying to the females looking on, the men in your life, if they're not looking at the program tonight, they, we, they, they need to get the messages that we're trying to put out there. Some of the health issues that we're concerned about where men are concerned and where they should be going in at an earlier stage before they have symptoms. Yeah. So the first educators are really the females in the family then? Well, very often, well, from babies. Yeah. It's, it's your mother. Um, the father is there as well. And, and, of course, we have to congratulate fathers are taking, uh, men are taking a more... Uh, proactive. proactive rule in bringing up their children, but very often in the first um, 10 years of life, the mother is the one who is um, educating. Mm -hmm. And later on in life, in, in marriage um, and in family life, it's very often the mother who is um, pushing the family to get to their doctor. So, mm -hmm. we, you know, the whole issue of doing men's health is we're trying to highlight some specific men's issues, but inevitably diabetes will come up. Hypertension mm -hmm. will come up, but we'll leave that for later on because yeah. um, we want to cover some of the areas that are more specific for men. And early detection. And, and yes. early detection. That's the key. Early detection, yes. Okay, so I know we're going to be looking at things like prostate cancer, testicular cancer, skin cancer, right. various cancers that seem to be more pre prevalent yes. in, in men. Um, would you like to begin with the... And then we'll go on to things like diabetes, cholesterol yes. and hypertension and so on. So, so let's... Talk about prostate cancer yeah. first of all. Mm -hmm. um, the, That's the, the most common one. So the statistics I was reading is that in America, mm -hmm. skin cancer is actually more common in men than prostate cancer. Mm -hmm. Now, I have to double check that, but maybe that's because of the fact that um, if you have um, lighter skin color mm -hmm. and more sun exposure, uh, you're more at risk of skin cancer. And we'll come back to skin cancer um, in a few minutes. But yeah. in Trinidad, as far as I know, prostate, prostate cancer is the number one cancer in men. Mm -hmm. um, and I think men are becoming more and more conscious of it. Mm -hmm. um, I have men, although my practice is mainly diabetes, I do have men coming in and asking for their uh, prostate uh, blood tests, mm -hmm. which we're going to talk about because yeah. there's some surprising facts about that. Yeah. Um, the thing about it is that patients often come in and say, Doc, can I have a blood test for cancer? Yeah. And there's actually no one blood test that can tell you about the different types of cancers. So if you're concerned about, um, for women, breast cancer, 
it's a mammogram or an ultrasound. If it's cervical cancer, it's pap smears in men. If it's prostate cancer, we're going to come to um, what should be done. So, um, prostate... so there are different screening processes for yes. each of the cancers. Absolutely. And that's what we're going to explore this yes. tonight. Yeah. So, so prostate cancer is the number one cancer uh, in men in Trinidad and especially in Afro-Trinidadian men. Mm -hmm. um, I, I, I think we're still not sure why prostate cancer is more common in the Afro-American and Afro-Trinidadian men. Um, and I have to compliment, I think a few years ago, our Prime Minister, um, Rowley, mm -hmm. did actually say that he went for his prostate screening. So that was quite, mm -hmm. you know, um, I have to compliment him for coming out and saying that and encouraging men mm -hmm. to go in and have their prostate screening. Um, but there's a, there's a debate going on about um, the efficacy of doing the blood tests. Mm -hmm. So yeah, doing a prostate examination mm -hmm. or screening for prostate cancer, let's say, um, is more complicated than people think. It's not just doing a blood test. Um, in fact, the first um, pro, uh, procedure that should be done is a digi digital rectal examination. Right, I've seen that DRE. Right, DRE. Digital rectal. Oh, and right. in <laughs> fact, that in, in, in someone who's experienced and who, are, who might be doing lots of these examinations, like a lot of family doctors, not mm -hmm. just a urologist, the urologists are the specialists where that is concerned. Um, they can be very, very, <laughs> I would say they have very sensitive fingers in that they're able to pick up whether on a digital rectal examination, so the gloves are put on. Um, and I just want to explain, I know it's in graphic terms because a lot of men are scared away from having the rectal examination done. Um, but it's a simple process. It takes less than a minute. And um, you don't need local anesthetic and all that to have it done. Mm -hmm. um, but the, 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 the prostate is examined through uh, the back passage, mm -hmm. the rectum. And it's almost like a, an apple, mm -hmm. a smooth surface mm -hmm. with a, with, with, with a midline uh, groove. Mm -hmm. And what you do when you, a doctor is examining the prostate, you're trying to make sure that the surface of the prostate is smooth, mm -hmm. there are no bumps, or there are no, no lumps, and you want to try and feel that midline and you get an idea whether the prostate is enlarged or not. Right, so there was this controversial yes. um, issue as, with regards to another right. form of screening. So, so the popular test that people ask for is the prostate-specific antigen, the PSC. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now, <clears throat> one of the things to remember is if you have had a rectal examination done, you should not do a PSA, I think, for about a week after mm -hmm. because it sends up the PSA. Um, after vigorous exercise, there, there are a few things you should not um, immediately do a uh, PSA immediately after. However, the latest NICE guidelines, and we have a clip um, from one of the other screening bodies, mm -hmm. actually says um, they're advocating against doing the PSA routinely. Now, we are going to open up the lines. The telephone number is on the screen in, in about 20 minutes' time, and mm -hmm. people may have questions about this because the PSA is done. And I have to say, I do PSAs a lot mm -hmm. in my diabetic patients, but um, this clip is going to explain um, why the PSA could be misleading and could lead to unnecessary investigations. Before we play the clip, I have one question. Yes. What does NICE mean? You said talk okay, about so NICE guidelines. What are the, what is N, is it NICE so and anagram? NICE, capital NICE, that's the National Institute for Clinical Excellence in the UK. Okay. That's the um, governing body in the UK for clinical standards. Mm -hmm. um, people might get confused. The General Medical Council is the um, the body that regulates doctors, mm -hmm. but the NICE, uh, the, uh, NICE guidelines uh, is a scientific body that does ongoing research and every few years, and I was reviewing some of this recently, and I was amazed as, co as compared to 10 years ago, some areas um, that I have not reviewed for a while mm -hmm. have changed even in the last two or three years. So um, NICE is the UK guidelines, but the US guidelines, the US also have their guidelines, which might be similar, but sometimes there are a few little subtle differences. Okay. So can we have that clip now, Josh?
The U.S. Preventive Services Task Force has updated its prostate cancer screening recommendation statement to recommend that clinicians individualize PSA screening for men aged 55 to 69. Why the change? Well, in men aged 55 to 69, prostate-specific antigen, or PSA screening, yields a small potential prostate cancer mortality benefit and known harms over a period of 10 to 15 years. Studies show that of 1,000 men offered PSA-based screening, 240 get a positive result. Of those, 140 positive PSA results are false positives, while 100 of the 240 get a positive biopsy showing definite cancer. 20 to 50 of the 100 with definite cancer will have cancer that never grows, spreads, or harms them. That is cancer overdiagnosis. 80 of the 100 will choose surgery or radiation, 50 will develop erectile dysfunction, and 15 will develop urinary incontinence. About one man in a thousand avoids death from prostate cancer. Based on these numbers, the task force does not recommend PSA screening unless men express a preference for it after being informed of and understanding that few men will benefit and many men will be harmed. A grade C recommendation, meaning selectively offer or provide PSA screening based on professional judgment and patient values. There's moderate certainty that the net benefit is small for some men. This grade C recommendation is a change from the grade D 2012 recommendation not to screen because of long-term trial follow-up confirming small mortality benefit and increased use of active PSA surveillance in place of surgery since the last recommendation. African-American men and those with a family history are more likely to develop prostate cancer, and African-American men have twice the mortality from prostate cancer as white men. It's possible that African-American men and those with a family history may experience greater benefits from any and earlier age screening, but the task force was unable to make separate recommendations pending more direct evidence of net benefit. For all men aged 70 and older, including African-American men and those with family histories of prostate cancer, the task force recommends against routine PSA-based screening because the potential benefits don't outweigh the risks of false positive results, harms from biopsy and treatment, and cancer overdiagnosis, a grade D recommendation meaning clinicians should discourage use of PSA screening there is moderate certainty that the benefits do not outweigh the expected harms. So, okay, so that goes quite against a lot of what we've been hearing before. And, and uh, a lot of what we do. Um, because the problem is, if we do a PSA, so I just want to explain the grade A, B, C, and D. So that's a kind of scientific grading. If, if you have grade A evidence, it's very strong evidence, obviously, mm -hmm. that you should be doing this in your daily practice. Um, grade B, slightly less. Grade C is um, a certain degree of uncertainty. So interestingly, the age group that was mentioned was 55 to 69 mm -hmm. with a grade C. Um, saying that s men selectively should be offered PSA screening. Now, we are not saying that men should not have a rectal examination. I just want to clarify mm -hmm. what we're talking about. But this is just the PSA. Right. So, so if you go in for your routine medicals, mm -hmm. um, a lot of people have um, uh, their employees um, working for big, bigger um, firms have their executive medicals, et cetera. Part of that would be a routine rectal examination. Um, so we're not saying that you should not have a rectal examination. What we're talking about is a PSA. And, and, and again, PSA stands for? Prostate-specific antigen. antigen. Okay. So summarizing that, what, what we are seeing is that it is saying that if you offer all men above 50, say, PSA screening, um, you will pick up a lot of false negatives, mm -hmm. one. So these men, because, you know, as, as a doctor who's not a specialist in that area, if I pick up a man with a PSA of five or six, um, I may still refer him to a urologist because mm -hmm. you have this anxiety and the patient will have an anxiety that they're not missing a prostate cancer. 
Um, one of the things I would say is that very often, uh, speaking to the urologist, what they look at is the rate of increase of the PSA. So if they have someone with a PSA of five or six, they may not intervene in, uh, right away, mm -hmm. but they uh, may do limited investigations and then repeat the PSA in, five, in six months, in a year. And, and if the, the velocity, velocity of increase of the PSA is what they're looking at. But what the clip was trying to say is that the morbidity Mm -hmm. Even from a, a prostate biopsy, mm -hmm. I've seen several patients, especially, I don't know if especially diabetic patients, but I'm, that's a cohort I'm seeing because they're more prone to infections mm -hmm. coming back with infections after having a prostate biopsy. And they mentioned things like incontinence and erectile. Right. So that's after the, well. so, so if you, so out of one in maybe a hundred people with a raised PSA, um, you may have um, the biopsy done, which has complications, and then you may have other investigations. And then you may say, okay, you have prostate cancer, you have an operation done, but what they're saying is one in 1,000 one I mean, will was, actually have a benefit. That was quite startling, yeah. Because prostate cancer, some types of prostate cancers are, are some of the slowest growing cancers. Mm -hmm. And it's well known at post-mortems in men who are in their 80s and 90s may have a small focus of cancer in the prostate, but they have not died from that. Mm -hmm. They have died from a heart attack or a stroke. So uh, the grade D evidence is men over 70, they're saying discourage people mm -hmm. from doing their PSAs. So that's a little bit controversial, and maybe uh, we will have a urologist on in, 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 in future to see if they mm -hmm. agree with that. Um, but the selective group that is especially applicable here in Trinidad is the Afro-Caribbean population. Right. So, so men, I would say over 50, mm -hmm. um, if they're Afro-Caribbean, but especially if they have a family history of prostate cancer, I probably would lean towards doing, um, encouraging, the, of course, the digital rectal examination and doing the PSA as well. And At what age? From I, I, I would encourage, I mean, the guidelines I had was over 45, yeah. um, but I think by 50, you should be doing your PSA. Mm -hmm. If you're Afro-Caribbean predisposed and, and a family history, and um, so that's a selective population we're dealing with here in Trinidad. Right. So we've just got the uh, nod that we're going for our first oh, break. Oh, already. Um, uh, when we return, uh, we will continue with men's health, particularly with regards to various forms of cancer that they are predisposed to and need um, screening for early detection. We'll return in a few minutes to Your Health, Your Choice. Don't go away. For a safe place for the whole family? Well, now you found it. We are ACTN The Voice, your family-friendly station. Whether it's current affairs, kids and classic TV, sport and community features, Christian and music programming, plus so much more, ACTN is the station for you. Join us each day for programming that puts morals, values and family first. We are ACTN The Voice, your family-friendly station. Exclusively on ACTN The Voice, this is Messenger TV. Join us as John and Lisa Bevere equip and empower generations of Christians, both young and old, developing uncompromising followers of Christ who transform our world. Starting on Mondays at 8 a.m. with repeats to fit any schedule. Tune in, log in, or click on the word like never before. Stay tuned for a new experience from the Word of God with Messenger TV. Exclusively on ACTN The Voice. You're watching ACTN, The Voice. ACTN, The Voice, your family-friendly station.
Welcome back to Your Health, Your Choice, and our medical trivia uh, yes. preceded this. So, so the question was if more men die from prostate cancer and any other type of cancer. So while we're seeing that prostate cancer is the most common cancer in men, it's not necessarily the most common cancer that men die of. Mm -hmm. Lung cancer, well, that's U.S. figures. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure in Trinidad. Um, lung cancer is um, the one that most men, that men die of most. Frequently. Frequently, yes. Okay. Right. So we, before the break, we looked at, we were able to look at prostate cancer and the screenings that are, are used for that particular kind. Um, we want to move on now to testicular cancer, yes. which is an uncommon cancer. Right. So it's not one that we talk about a lot. Um, and as opposed to <clears throat> prostate cancer that um, presents uh, later on in life mm -hmm. in, in men, um, tes testicular cancer is an earlier onset between 20 to 54 years old. Mm -hmm. And um, the American Cancer Society actually advocates that um, at a routine medical examination, um, men should be examined or at least taught how to um, do self-testicular Mm -hmm. um, examination. Now, mm -hmm. you know, we, we encourage women to do breast examinations, but I don't think we are as aggressive in um, uh, teaching men mm -hmm. how to do testicular examination. And, and, mm -hmm. and basically what you're looking for, um, especially after having a warm shower, um, you, it's, it's just feeling for any lumps or bumps um, or anything unusual mm. uh, uh, about um, the uh, testicles. Remind, remind you that the testes is what produces um, uh, sperm mm -hmm. and uh, testosterone as well. And um, so, so one of the things we should be encouraging men to do is self-examination, but on routine medical examinations with your family doctor. Um, again, I know that men tend not to go in routinely. Um, but again, if this is picked up at an early stage, uh, it can be uh, interview. You, there, there can be intervention. It's, it is a surgical intervention. Mm -hmm. um, the the, the, the uh, bump or lump or whatever would have to be removed and sent to the lab uh, for testing to see if it's just an innocent lump or if it is cancerous and then it can be treated. Um, it's not common, but um, it, it's not uncommon as well. Right. So it's something that men in their, you know, between 20 to 50 years old should be um, uh, examining themselves every so often, or, or if they go to their family doctors. Okay, so we looked at the most common one, um, at least in Trinidad, prostate. prostate. The least common, testicular. Mm -hmm. The second, apparently, the second most common cause of death from any cancer is colorectal cancer. You, can you explain a little more about that? Right, so this is a big one, um, and I have talked about my personal experience with this. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, colorectal cancer is um, unfortunately becoming more and more common. It's, uh, the st statistics show that it's more common in men than women, and um, we are not sure if it's linked. You know, there are various theories out there about red meat, um, uh, about some of the toxic um, chemicals that are added to foods mm -hmm. um, that might be um, raising the uh, incidence of colorectal cancer. Um, but we're still not sure. We know it's more, it's slightly more common in men um, than women. Mm -hmm. And uh, there might be dietary causes. So we have, I think it's slide five um, the, on the PowerPoint that shows how these cancers um, develop. So um, it, it, they start as a, it's a small polyp. So mm -hmm. what you're seeing there is a slightly raised, that's a, on a colonoscopy, um, which I'll talk about. Mm -hmm. um, and you see slightly raised areas. And then the next slide, it's slide six, shows um, the doctor doing a colonoscopy. And I've, I have to say I've had two colonoscopies in the last two years. Mm -hmm. um, and you actually can see on the screen uh, the um, bowel, and if there are any polyps or if there are any growths, some can be removed during the procedure. Um, so the doctor, the gastroenterologist, can actually, um, they have the devices that can either burn out um, the, if it's a small growth, or they can use a, um, a clip to actually snag the polyp and pull it out. So we can just mm -hmm. come off that slide and okay. talk a little bit more about that. Uh what about the test? These are the various kinds of tests we can right. do for colon cancer. So interestingly, 
In the US and the UK, again, the NICE guidelines actually advocate that um, men and women mm -hmm. over, it's, I think, 45 to 50 should have um, uh, colon, colorectal screening with a colonoscopy. So this is a flexible fiber optic instrument mm -hmm. that's um, inserted into the back passage. Mm -hmm. um, some, most doctors would give a slight sedative, so it's not very painful. painful. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, they can uh, go up. So a complete colonoscopy, and this is important to say, because um, if you go to someone who's not experienced, they may not get the um, instrument right up the colon, across the transverse. transverse colon, and then um, the descending colon, the mm. cecum, you, that's a complete colonoscopy. Mm. And if, you're, if you don't do your bowel prep properly, mm. and, and you know, I often tell people from my experience, the bowel prep is the most difficult part yeah. because you have to be um, on fluids from the day before um, and you have to take the bowel prep so they can have a nice clear view. Um, and if, if you don't have that, then it's an in, in, incomplete colonoscopy. And I've had one patient who that was the case. And fortunately, on a subsequent colonoscopy, um, the uh, cancer was picked up. Mm -hmm. um, so the, the colonoscopy should be done. Now, the NICE guidelines, which is in the UK, says it should be done, but they don't have the resources on the NHS. Now, of course, in the US, with people's private medical insurance, they can literally go into a gastroenterologist and, and have a colonoscopy every five to 10 years. Um, in, 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 the, in the UK, they're still talking about doing fecal occult uh, blood testing. That's a stool sample mm -hmm. for hidden blood. Mm -hmm. Now, one of the common misconceptions is that you will see blood in the stool if you have uh, colorectal cancer. Mm -hmm. um, that is a late presentation. Right, so we're looking for early detection. For, for early detection. Yeah. So if you have a family history um, of colon cancer, especially a first degree mm -hmm. relative, so a brother, sister, father or mother with colon cancer, you should be screened, mm -hmm. um, I would say, from your 40s. You should have a first colonoscopy. And then every five years or every 10 years. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, uh, the stool test, as I say, you take about three samples. Um, and it's sent to the lab, mm -hmm. and they look under a microscope for hidden blood. But if you see blood in the stool, you still have to go on and do the colonoscopy. Mm -hmm. So the, the stool test is really a screening test. Um, There's some other tests they're doing, um, looking at a, it's an immune assay, um, fecal test. Um, there's a virtual colonoscopy that can be done right. where um, you're not doing the uh, actual colonoscopy, but it's a CT scan that's done. And, um, and that can... should be pretty pain free then. <laughs> well, um, pretty, yeah, as a CT scan, it's radiation, mm -hmm. um, pain free. But again, I tell patients even if you do the virtual colonoscopy, the gold standard. Mm -hmm. is really the colonoscopy. So I think people have to weigh up um, the discomfort and, you know, they, people think that it's embarrassing. I would tell you when the doctors who do this and this is a very professional, mm -hmm. um, at least the people I've been to, and um, they really put you at ease and um, this whole fallacy about... And the stigma. And stigma associated with it. It's, it's really... It, it, you know, you're saving lives by doing it at an early stage. Mm -hmm. um, so the treatment, of course, if you pick up a polyp, mm -hmm. it can be removed, sent to the lab. And of course, if you pick up a colon cancer early enough, um, a stage one or stage two, um, you might have to have an operation, but you may um, have no spread mm -hmm. beyond the bowel wall. And um, so you don't need radiation or chemotherapy. Even if you need radiation and chemotherapy, um, it's stage three or stage four, um, li lives can be saved. But the key to this is, um, now I, there are some risk factors. I, I said we, we don't, mm -hmm. really, but people who are smokers mm -hmm. and heavy alcohol drinkers are at a higher risk. And there is still this theory about um, eating lots of red meat. Um, mm -hmm. And some people would even say, uh, you know, I was seeing something on Facebook um, last week about eating lots of chicken. Now, 
I have to say, I'm a little bit confused by that, and I'm not propagating this because I have to do some research. Um, but people are saying because of the chemicals. The steroids that are injected uh, right. into the chickens. Um, yeah. that well, those are battery chickens, chickens that are raised in, in battery farms. Right, so rather than natural. They, yeah, free-range chickens, chickens that are allowed to move naturally, wouldn't be injected with steroids and are probably the more healthy right. ones to go for. Yes. So I want to encourage men, and although we're talking about men's health, mm -hmm. uh, we, uh, we are encouraging men and women because colorectal cancer is also the second commonest cancer after breast cancer in women. In women. Um, okay. So um, if you don't want to do the colonoscopy, maybe the stool test is the way to go. Mm -hmm. um, and I know, again, on people doing executive medicals, that's done. I don't think you're going to have, uh, if you go to the health centers and ask for a routine fecal occult blood test, I don't think the hospitals are able to cope with it. We just don't have the resources and the government service, unfortunately. Okay. Um, so uh, don't wait on symptoms. Um, yeah. Get screened. Just a at, routine tests at for an, men at a certain <clears throat> age. They're expected. I would say over 45 to 50. Okay. You should be asking your doctors about it. Mm -hmm. um, if you go privately, it is a little bit expensive, between three to $5,000 to have it done. So if you don't have health insurance, it's, it's a little bit of a cost. But, um, but you can get colonoscopies done in the hospital, but not for routine screening as far mm -hmm. as I know. So there's a difference. Um, generally, the, the, the hospitals will do colonoscopies when people present with bleeding, mm -hmm. et cetera, weight loss and iron deficiency anemia. Mm. So iron deficiency, so especially in the older age group, like someone I saw this week who's in her 80s, lost about 15 to 20 pounds, um, has, they have a slight iron deficiency anemia, which means there's blood loss from somewhere. Um, and in that age group, uh, and, and also some bowel symptoms of constipation, mm -hmm. then, yeah. Those are the indicators. Uh, some of the indicators, yeah. some red flags, we call it. For colorectal cancer. Colorectal cancer. I just okay, so we've wanted to at... encourage people about yeah, the number. It's, it's half yeah. eight now, so. Right, so we're taking your calls. Um, the number is at the bottom of your screen there. Six, um, and Dr. Khan will be happy to answer any of the yeah. questions you have on uh, any of the cancers. Yeah that we are discussing this evening. As far as I'm able to. As far as he's able to. Yes. So Six. we've looked at uh, prostate cancer, testicular cancer, colorectal cancer. Now we want to just examine uh, skin cancer. Right. So in, in Trinidad, we don't talk a lot about skin cancer, but it is common, mm -hmm. um, skin cancer. Especially as we're in a tropical environment. In a tropical environment. environment. Um, again, uh, most types of skin cancers, men are two to three times more likely to have skin cancers than women, and people of a lighter skin color, less melanin mm -hmm. um, under the, in the skin, um, are more at risk of having skin cancer. And of course, we know sun exposure mm -hmm. is the the main driving force. And tanning um, beds. And, and, and tanning <laughs> beds as well. Yeah. Um, you know, interestingly, the very um, unfortunate popular scenario was Bob Marley, mm -hmm. um, who um, was of a darker skin color, um, but uh, developed a melanoma mm -hmm. um, of the foot, I think, and it was picked up at a late stage. Um, so there are different types of skin cancers. Um, we have a clip on this, and I think we should have enough time to play it before we go to our second break. Yes. Um, so we're going to go to our that. second clip. clip. Yes. Skin cancer, Skin. like cancer in other organs of the body, is the result of the uncontrolled abnormal growth of cells. The transformation of normal skin cells into skin cancer has a variety of causes, the most common being sun exposure, family history, and ethnicity. When the cells of the skin begin to grow in an uncontrolled abnormal fashion, a tumor will result. This tumor is malignant. A malignant tumor is considered a cancer and should be removed to prevent the possible invasion and destruction of surrounding normal tissue or spread of the cancer to other organs of the body. This is known as metastasis. Fortunately, metastasis of skin cancer is not common. Basal cell carcinoma, BCC, is the most common type of skin cancer in the United States. Approximately 1 million cases of BCC occur annually. About 80% of all skin cancer cases are BCC, the slowest growing and least dangerous of the three common types of skin cancer, and it rarely metastasizes. BCC develops from the cells in the epidermis, the surface layer of the skin known as the basal cell layer. 
basal cell carcinoma may have many different appearances. It most commonly appears as a small pearly skin-colored bump or nodule. Basal cell carcinoma can also appear as a flat growth, a scar, or scaling area. Untreated basal cell carcinomas may begin to bleed, crust over, and spread into surrounding tissue, leading to more extensive surgery and scarring. Squamous cell carcinoma, SCC, is the second most common type of skin cancer in the United States. Approximately 200,000 cases occur annually. SCC is responsible for about 16% of all skin cancer cases. This cancer develops from cells in the epidermis known as squamous cells. Squamous cell carcinomas are more dangerous than BCC because they have a greater tendency to recur after surgery and to metastasize to other organs in the body. It often appears as a red nodule or rough scaling patch. Malignant melanoma, MM, is a life-threatening skin cancer that develops from the pigment-forming cells in the skin. It often presents as a black or brown mole. It can also include other irregular colors such as red, white, blue, and gray. Malignant melanoma is the least common of the three types of skin cancers, but it is the most dangerous because it has a strong tendency to metastasize to distant organs. It start as small bumps on the skin that slowly or sometimes rapidly enlarge. These bumps are usually pain-free and may have been present for a period greater than two weeks. Skin cancers frequently undergo periods of ulceration and bleeding followed by healing, then a repeat of this cycle. Your dermatologist should examine any skin lesion that has a history of bleeding. Skin cancers may have a variety of appearances. They may be flesh-colored, waxy or pearly, red scaly patches, large tumor masses, or sores that do not heal. A biopsy may be required to determine if the skin lesion is in fact a skin cancer. Skin cancers frequently invade surrounding normal tissue, causing extensive destruction of skin and bodily structures. Many cancers may form roots or fingers of diseased tissue that can extend beyond the boundaries of the visible cancer. Cancers that are most likely to form these complicated root systems are located in cosmetically sensitive or functionally critical areas around the ears, eyes, nose, lips, and scalp. Located in areas where excess tissue is minimal, such as the fingers and genitals, or where circulation is poor. Cancers that grow rapidly and or uncontrollably, or are cancers that have been previously treated. Mohs micrographic surgery is the most precise method for skin cancer removal with the highest cure rates. Mohs micrographic surgery is effective for most types of skin cancer. However, it is most commonly used to treat basal and squamous cell carcinomas. In recent years, we have seen an increase in skin cancer rates. One of the major risk factors that can be controlled is sun exposure. It is important to keep exposed skin out of direct sun and to use a good sunscreen on exposed skin when you are in open daylight for more than a few minutes. Damage to the skin is cumulative. The best prevention is to protect your skin from direct sunlight as much as possible. Sunburns are the leading cause of skin cancer. Tanning is the skin's defense response to the skin's damaging rays, ultraviolet light, but tanning does not prevent skin cancer. One severe sunburn can increase your risk of skin cancer by as much as 50%. Sun damage to the skin accumulates over many years of exposure, and about 90% of sun-induced skin cancer occurs in the areas that have the greatest exposure, namely the head, neck, and forearms. People with a family history of skin cancer are at an increased risk for developing skin cancer. Individuals with fair complexions develop skin cancer more frequently than those with dark skin. Skin cancer, you are likely to develop another in the years ahead. To minimize your problems with skin cancer, you should be evaluated frequently for new suspicious lesions on your skin. Oh. <laughs> so, <laughs> welcome back to uh, Your Health, Your Choice, and thanks for joining us again. Um, after looking at, after the looking clip, at the, that we got very, distracted. very long clip, yes. which we got distracted. You, you were but, talking <laughs> about a relative who... I was talking about, yeah, my dad actually had, um, had to have yeah. a skin... <laughs> Cancer. Skin, skin yeah. cancer um, removal. removal. Yeah. Yeah. I think we have to go to our second break, but uh, Josh t uh, told us about two calls that came in. One, a man who is well, um, asking, asking if he should be screened. Well, um, if you're over 50, 
um, your Afro Trinidadian, I, I think you should have at least a digital digital rectal examination at some point, mm -hmm. and then decide if a PSA screening is, mm -hmm. is necessary. Uh, definitely colonoscopy, I would say over 50. I am a strong advocate for if, if you can afford it, to have it done. A second person rang asking about a husband who had a, a prostate biopsy, and now has a swelling in the groin. Now, I'm a little bit concerned about that because um, I don't know what the results of the, of the prostate biopsy was, but any swelling in the groin um, could be a lymph node that is enlarged, a lymph mm -hmm. gland, and that could in, 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 uh, indicate infection mm -hmm. or it can indicate some kind of um, uh, tumor growth. So you, that needs to be checked out. And so I would strongly advise that, that your husband goes back to your doctor and, and gets that checked out. Okay, so thank you for your calls. Uh, we're going for our, our second break. And when we return, we'll be looking at uh, some of the other uh, diseases that tend to affect men uh, more prevalently than women. Uh, your Health, Your Choice returns in a few minutes. So don't go away. Sunday at 2 p.m. on ACTM The Voice. We'll be taking you on a journey down memory lane with our Sunday classics. Relive the moments. Bonanza at 2 p.m. Little House on the Prairie at 3 p.m. Gilligan's Island at 4 p.m. Family Matters at 4.30 p.m. Hogan's Heroes at 5 p.m. The Jeffersons at 5.30 p.m. This is Sunday Classics on ACTN The Voice. Exclusively on ACTN The Voice, this is Messenger TV. Join us as John and Lisa Bevere equip and empower generations of Christians, both young and old, developing uncompromising followers of Christ who transform our world. Starting on Mondays at 8 a.m. with repeats to fit any schedule. Tune in, log in, or click on the word like never before. Stay tuned for a new experience from the Word of God with Messenger TV. Exclusively on ACTN The Voice. Hi, this is Denise Plummer, and you're watching ACTN. There's no turning back, oh no, 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 no. With Jesus on your side, that's the way to go. There's no turning back, oh no, 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 no. Cause there is nothing greater when Jesus gives you favor. There's no turning back, oh no, 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 no. Okay, your health, your choice. Uh, thank you again for joining us this evening. We were looking at the various cancers that are more prevalent in men than women uh, with regards to men's health. And uh, we would like you to keep your calls coming in. 652-4855, um, the number is at the bottom of your screen. If you were looking at this on a Thursday or a Sunday when we have repeats of the program, you can call 482-4269, 482 and uh, we will get back to you with answers to your questions then. Um, so before the break, we were looking at skin cancer. Mm -hmm. And um, I know there's a slide well, that you wanted yes, to share Yes, there's just with one us. last slide, slide eight on the PowerPoint, um, that actually shows a melanoma and why... Uh, oh, um, eight. Slide seven or eight. Um, yes, that's, that's it. it. Mm -hmm. So you can look at this. And the reason, so why you should be seeing a dermatologist or a family doctor if you have something like this. Now, it is a lighter skin color, and so if you're darker skin color, you may not see it, but you can see that the, 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 the lesion has irregular edges. Mm -hmm. and, so the and shape of the it. The shape, the size, uh -huh. if it's and above five millimeters in diameter, mm -hmm. I believe, um, and the color, color, the differentiation of color, it's not homogeneous in color. Mm -hmm. so, so that's 
a skin lesion that you would be concerned about. Right. So we need to look for size, shape, size, and color. Size, shape, and the variation of color. Okay. And okay. Um, a dermatologist is, is the person, if you see a family doctor today, they can sc um, screen you, see if it's a, a concern, but then you need to see a dermatologist who would then decide if you need a biopsy or if you need that lesion removed. Okay, so I think we're done with the cancers now, but carnival is in the air. Yes. And I know that there are two very important health issues that you'd like to address with regards to men's health. Right. So um, uh, sexually transmitted diseases mm -hmm. um, very often can be silent. Mm -hmm. um, uh, the one that is um, very often at the top of people's list is uh, HIV, human immunodeficiency uh, virus. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, people do sometimes come in asking, and in fact, uh, even when you're going for occupational health screening in, in, in other countries, the HIV test is one of the tests that is routinely done. Now, there are different types of HIV blood uh, assays that can be done. And one of the important things to remember is if you had an exposure mm -hmm. um, last week and you do an HIV test today, it may still be negative. Mm -hmm. You may take a while for a zero conversion for that test to be actually shown up as positive. So uh, at least the NICE guidelines again says, yeah. if you had an exposure, unprotected intercourse um, in a high risk group and the test is negative, in the first week or so, it should be repeated probably in about three months' time. Okay. I think we have a call on the line. Uh, good evening. Yeah, good night, Doc. Yeah. Uh, I want to find out if you get some sores on your foot. And I went to the skin specialist. He gave me a shot. It's too early. And it passed, but it would come back. Are you... Are you... Take a while. No. Hello? Are you there, but... Um, no. Okay. Um, I, from what I heard is... Uh, if you so could just remind the viewers to mute your television when you call in, because we get the feedback here and we don't hear you very clearly. Yeah. So, um, recurrent sores on the feet can be due to various things. Um, uh, we're using the word sores in a loose way. Mm -hmm. um, you have things like psoriasis, um, there's eczematous changes on the feet. Um, diabetics do tend to get um, various types of skin lesions. Um, if he said, I think his dermatologist gave him some steroids, mm -hmm. which indicates that it might be some kind of inflammatory process because mm -hmm. um, steroids are acting against the immune system. Mm -hmm. So um, the problem with skin conditions like diabetes, some skin conditions are chronic. Um, you know, if you have an acute uh, allergic reaction, it may just be a one-off, uh, raised um, allergic urticarial type rash. But uh, if you have uh, psoriasis or eczema, it could be recurrent, mm -hmm. and, and pa patients need to understand that. So you may be, have to be on treatment long term. Right. So we have about 10 more minutes. Yes. Um, you were going to share so, something on STDs. Right. So um, sexually transmitted diseases. So, um, you know, the one that people are very com uh, concerned about it is HIV. And of course, we now uh, are in a fortunate position in that people could live successfully with HIV for many, many years because um, there are various um, antiviral drugs mm -hmm. that are now available. But again, prevention is the theme. Mm -hmm. And remember, HIV is not just um, uh, the, uh, um, t uh, restricted to same-sex relationships, but it's heterosexual as well, and it can be spread from mother to baby. Right. Um, so uh, barrier methods, mm -hmm. um, using condoms during sexual intercourse. But, you know, we come back, and I don't, you know, we're on a Christian station, so I don't want to come across in a judgmental way. But I, you know, our former Minister of Health made some statements about Carnival, and I'm sure and one of the popular soca artists came out in defense of the songs that are being sang. Song. But, song. Uh, thank you. Linda does the ESB, the <laughs> English Speaking Board training, and I have benefited from it, although um, I didn't do the exams, um, but she has a list of corrections for me when I preach on a Sunday morning. So I would encourage you, it's an excellent training, English Speaking Board. You can ring on 482-4269 or 350-6200. 
Yes. That's a plug for ESB. Mm -hmm. um, there's no doubt, and I was speaking to someone um, not from, well, originally Trinidadian, but lives in America, and she, she, her term was, we live in a very sexualized mm -hmm. culture. Mm -hmm. And uh, especially around carnival time, people seem to, be, to, to get carried away with the music, alcohol, and there is no doubt there's a spike of sexually transmitted diseases, a spike of unwanted pregnancies, um, uh, nine months. The statistics later. are there. The statistics yeah. are there. And the lyrics speak for themselves as well. Uh, absolutely. They? You know, and, and sometimes we're afraid to, mm -hmm. to talk about this because we think we've been politically incorrect. I am proud of our culture, our steel pan, um, calypso, etc. But if the songs are glorifying and objectifying women, mm -hmm. I think that is from my point of view, inappropriate, and it encourages behavior that people regret down the road. Like sexually transmitted diseases. And so all so really we're not just talking about HIV. Yeah. We're talking about chlamydia. Mm -hmm. Now, chlamydia is a very hidden sexually transmitted disease. And in fact, chlamydia is far more, it's probably one of the most common sexually transmitted diseases. And it can often be silent, both in men and women, leading to infertility um, and problems five, ten years down the road. And of course, we have the ones like gonorrhea, um, trichomonas, um, we have um, syphilis, which is becoming more common again. Mm -hmm. um, now, these diseases can be treated, um, but to prevent sexually transmitted diseases, we should be um, restricting our behavior yeah, because the thing is that the more sexual partners you have without having revealed that you've got a sexually transmitted disease, the more the problem is exacerbated. So, uh, and absolutely. And, you know, we, we can say when, you've, when you have sex with someone, you've, you're really having sex with everyone else you have had sex with before. Now, that's, mm -hmm. a, that's an astounding statement to make. But if that person has picked up um, sexually transmitted diseases, and of course, uh, we're not past the watershed um, time uh, we're before nine, but but we're not just talking about um, uh, penetrative sex. We're talking about oral sex, and uh, you can pick up diseases as well. Herpes, for example, mm -hmm. is another one that's very very common. And remember, there are different types. Let's not uh, confuse herpes simplex. Mm -hmm. um, uh, herpes simplex has various uh, one, two, and three, and there's the one that causes just mouth sores. But then there's uh, genital herpes, which is sexually transmitted. So. Um, uh, Sexually transmitted diseases, men, you need to be screened um, mm -hmm. and uh, you need to have responsible behavior, mm -hmm. especially um, over this period of time. Right, so safe sex. But then with HIV, we also have to be careful about um, drug users not using the same needles. Needles, yes. Yes. Yeah. And of course, hepatitis C is the other thing that it can be um, transmitted through uh, uh, sharing of needles, etc. Mm -hmm. The last one I think we might have time for is... Yeah, we have five minutes. So. Right, glaucoma. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. So... Uh, more, men are more affected yeah. by glaucoma yeah. than women. I, I think we have slide 19, which might be the last slide we're mm -hmm. showing. Um, 18, you're eight, 18 or 19. Um, Josh, that, that's just screening for glaucoma. So glaucoma is increased pressure at the back of the eye, and you go to an optometrist or ophthalmo ophthalmologist. If we, yes, and this is the um, one of the instruments that's used, and um, you can be screened for glaucoma. They they can measure the pressure um, in the eyes, and also they can look at the optic disc if there's any swelling of the optic disc. And now, so we could just come off that. So then um, you can detect whether there's damage to yes. the optic nerve or not. Right. And there's process. something called the OCT now that most of the ophthalmologists right. and opt optometrists have in their instruments to do this. And it gives an idea of the um, back of the eyes, whether there's right. any cause for concern. Right. And if this isn't caught in time, it could be irreversible eye loss. Yes, blindness. So unfortunate. Mm -hmm. And so if you have a family history of glaucoma, especially, mm -hmm. you should be screened for glaucoma from mm -hmm. maybe your 40s or 50s. And um, if, if you have glaucoma, you may have to be on eye drops for the rest of your life. OK, so at what ages would they be tested and for how long? I would say if you have a family history of glaucoma, you mm -hmm. should be screened for glaucoma from your 30s and 40s. But of course, if you're going in for regular eye checks, 
Um, and especially if you're diabetic, you should be having an eye check. Um, there is a sort of loose relationship between diabetes and glaucoma. There's a relationship there as well as diabetes and cataracts. Mm -hmm. And you should, so we have not had chance to talk about diabetes, hypertension, hyperlipidemia tonight. Cholesterol. Time is gone. No. Uh, we can mm -hmm. come back to that. Men, you need to be checking yourselves for those as well. Mm -hmm. But uh, glaucoma is the one that we were going to end with. Right, so we have one more minute. Okay, um, so quickly, um, they can ring. Yeah. <laughs> Oh, sorry. They can ring on 4824269 during the week, 4824269 for more information and for um, information about the Anaposis Chapel and the Anaposis Medical Center. Um, quickly, last Sunday I shared with our church that um, the things you choose to sow today, positive things you choose to sow, you will reap in the months and years ahead. I want to ask you, don't play the blame game. Don't blame anyone else for the outcomes in your life. I have chosen to sow positive seed into my marriage as a father, um, as a pastor, as a medical doctor, and hopefully I will see an abundant harvest. Second Corinthians 9 says, those who sow generously will reap also generously. Okay. Right. So thank you again for joining us on Your Health, Your Choice. I'll leave you with these last choice words. Every smile, every loving word, every kind action is a reflection of the beauty of your heart and your soul. Have a good week, and we hope to see you in about a fortnight's time. But this will be replayed. This is good, yeah. This program is going to be replayed on, a, on Thursday and on Sunday. Yeah. So uh, we'll see you again, and um, do enjoy the rest of the week. <laughs>